quality is usually, you know, 70, 80%, um, but it gets, it's a good way to get labeling. Uh, so that's, <laughs> excuse me, that's one idea. Another idea I had, I don't know, like in discussion, so it wasn't really just my idea, but is that can we say this combination of sentiment equals that? So, like, you know, if, um, you know, if it's ambivalent and angry, it, it means this point in the code or the script. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so basically, you know, can we use can we use the data we do have that is generated with sentiment analysis and basically construct the other kind of analysis? Okay, I see. I think I'm getting Yeah, so I don't know. So here's some ideas. I'm going to talk to the client, make sure I understand what they're actually trying to accomplish and what their actual data set looks like, and make sure there isn't any like loss of translation between people I'm talking to. Gotcha. Um, then we'll figure it out. Uh, but I thought it was—I thought it was in a slightly better state. So, yeah, we're good. We got camera. Oh, really cool. Um, actually, can we test sound though? Sure. Because I think this mic is the sound, um, which does not have a clip, but may have much better sound than well, Mac might have good sound, but generally laptop mics. So. Yeah. Uh, here, so you want to get that. Okay. Well, so I got to do it. Blow it over here, Carl. All right, you want to try to say it? Say it. Testing, testing on two. Actually, pretty good. Is it? Uh, yeah, we can put a little. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't sound bad. Yeah, okay. It's like that, sir. Hey. Uh, if you didn't see it, there's a sign-in sheet because I give up on trying to do it in the slip. So I believe it's the one sources, the second sources. Okay. I'm uh, reading that one. Okay. Updated, made my updates, and then upload the lectures, the names that you Okay, okay. cool. So, yeah, that way I can upload it to uh, Piazza. Good. Um, all right, so we're going to do things slightly differently today. So we're going to continue with uh, CNNs and with uh, Chris talking. Um, but then I'll do it, the announcements in the middle, basically, and we'll talk about some machine learning pipeline stuff. Um, but yeah, so but there's a bunch of announcements, so I want to make sure we cover those. Yeah, and so basically we'll do a quick review uh, today. Um, we'll kind of go through what we talked about on Tuesday, uh, and then we'll kind of start talking about some of uh, some of the ways that we break CNNs. Um, we'll look at some real world examples. Uh, and then we got a couple of other things to cover. So, um, Chris, so for our list, you guys can call me Chris. Any questions, whatever, feel free to reach out. Throw up. Um, just to kind of go back to our discussion on Tuesday, right? Our goal here is to figure out how and why these objects are detected, right? Amongst other things, when we start talking about computer vision. And, um, you know, we, we started on Tuesday discussing how we break this down to identify what the different ob objects are in the screen here. Uh, and then basically, how do we respond to them, right? And so we, we detect the objects, we uh, figure out what they are and how we need to then react to them. Um, this can be done through training, right? Where 
we say this is how you react to a certain thing or uh you know in the, in the true new new world ai how do we react to them without actually knowing how or, or what it is that we need to respond to so at a high level right this is the process that we go through for convolutional neural, neural networks right um through a definition in there right it's, it's basically a uh, deep learning algorithm that can um help us to take that input image which is where we start break it down put it into somewhat of a linear form so that we can then run our equation train our model classify what the image is that we're looking at and or match it against the classification and then return whatever results we need or move to the next step whatever that happens to be um <laughs> langdon pointed out that we never uh, we never actually defined uh a convolution right uh so um you know it, it, it's basically a mathematical operation um on on two functions that produces that third function okay so when we take an image and we and as we go, go through it here we start taking those um, filters and we lay them over the image to um, uh, inspect and detect those certain elements, right? Um, the output of, of those uh, filters lead to that, that third function, right? And that's how we express uh, the shape that is modified, okay? So jumping in, right? We've got our input and we're gonna start with a convolution. And essentially we're, converting our image to a grid, right? So that we can then use our filters to pass over the image to detect what those features are at the lowest level, right? The convolution itself is using those various filters to detect those edges, those curves, uh, and in some cases, colors, right? This probably looks familiar where we start to build out our feature map by running our filters over that image. And then, from a, a little more sophisticated example, breaking it down to RGB, right? And so now, instead of just using black and white, like we discussed the other day, now we look at RGB and how those filters discuss based on those three colors, if it's a color image, of course. Next, we used our, um, our uh, rectified linear unit, that one always is Gets away. Rolls right off the top. I know, really, it's, it's a tough one, right? We apply our ReLU uh, layer here, right? And then basically what we're doing is we're removing those negatives, as we talked about, right? And we're replacing those with zeros. Um, and this helps us to um, uh, remove the linearity, right? So um, our convolutions want to be linear. However, images are not, clearly, right? And so we want to remove those those dark dark blacks you can see you know when you look at the buildings the edges of the buildings are no longer in there and this tech this helps us to kind of relate what we're looking at um when when we do actually put this in a linear format and then we got into pooling a little bit we looked at average um min max or sorry some max right where we're now taking um, the, the sections that we've identified and we're identifying now um, one portion of that section, uh, max being uh, the most efficient, right? And we're doing this because we want to sort of reduce how much data we're gonna be fitting into the model, right? We only have finite amounts of CPU and so, you know, as, as you look deeper into a lot of these topics, all the links are, are on these pages for a lot of these articles and stuff. And they go into um, not only the, the mathematical equations in, in great detail as to what's actually happening as we feed these into our, um, in, in, into our systems. Essentially, um, by reducing that amount of data, it, it, it helps us from uh, overfitting our models. It helps us from um, slowing things down, it helps with the training process. And so, um, as, as you see, when you um, essentially, oops, one more thing. Um, and, uh, when we use this method, it allows us to 
um, reduce the amount of data, but it does not impact the quality of the image from a uh, detection standpoint. And it helps us to arrive, you know, basically is what we're expecting. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't impact the image that we have. And then we basically continue the same process, right? So this is going to run through a few times, depending on how many filters we use, how many parameters we have. Um, and, and, you know, there, there, this is one high level example. There are a lot of different algorithms that can be used and processes that can be used to um, get a, a better image overall. Then we talked about events, right? So however we recognize what an image is, we need to be able to recognize it no matter what the distortion is. And so this is one of the big challenges with CNNs is because you look at an image and from the front, it looks like that image. But as you turn it, as you turn it around, you know, you spin it on its axis, you flip it upside down, those types of um, different ways of manipulating that image um, and, and the objects inside of the image, uh, you should be able to handle that. And a well-trained CNN can. Um, but if we're looking to mimic computer vision and in, in, in a case like this where you have a face, you detect that face, but then if you turn this statue around, you have no idea if that's the same object, right? As a human, you look at that and you've got the perspective. So you take it from a side, you can see it. Well, computer vision doesn't have that capability, right? And so it needs to learn how to handle those types of events. So now we're gonna jump into the fully connected book. And this is essentially the process by which we flatten out what we have, and then we match it to a category that's available, right? So we're, we're basically putting it into a columnar vector. And, you know, to kind of look at this in a little more detail, um, you, you're running all your layers, you're flattening it out, and then you're looking at the chance of the image, um, the likelihood that it is, in fact, um, what you think it is, right? And, and what the computer classifies it as. So in this case, it's always on um, a scale of one. So in this case, the image that was fed in was a boat, or at least the, the computer perceived it to be a boat, right? Um, there was a small chance it was a dog or a cat or a bird, but pretty likely it was a boat based on that model. And, the, and this is really the final step before classifying that image um, and then combining and pooling um, your, your convolutional um, for your test results. So when we look at classification a little heavier, right? Our CNN is not trained, right? So we're we're great, you know, we're, we've got what we need. Um, now we can just go ahead and throw any images at that CNN and we can classify anything downstream, right? We've got what we need to continue to um, use that same model and we should be able to detect everything, right? Perfect, done? Well, maybe not, right? Our categories are defined. And those images hopefully will be assigned automatically that correct category and continue to train that model and, and improve that model. Now, where is this being used? So I grabbed a couple of examples. Um, again, the links down here, uh, this is, it's, it's interesting. Um, this was kind of like, it's almost like a, uh, a sales pitch for a company, right? But at the same time, um, I found the examples to be really useful. Um, so hopefully you guys do as well. Um, but essentially, they were looking at their top five projects that they're working on customers with. And I thought they were all pretty representative of what we're seeing, what I'm seeing at Microsoft from my customers as well. So automotive industry, right? We talked about that a little bit. You've got um, disaster relief and emergency situations. So this one's really interesting to look at that a little more. Um, you've got uh, medicine healthcare, right? That's pretty predominant. We hear about that a lot, um, especially in this part of the country, this part of the world. Um, you've got um, agriculture, which again was pretty cool, and then insurance. So now when we look at the automotive, right, I, I think we've, we've um, brought this, uh, this ex 
example and, and, and put it to bed at this point. But in essence, you know, you've got the object detection happening there in the in the top right. Um, you know, you've got sort of what what the, the vehicle is seeing um, in, in the middle there um, from a range perspective, and then one down the bottom, um, the, the right rear camera of the vehicle. Right. So automotive pretty predominant. You know, we're trying to we're trying to make um, driving safer for everybody. Disaster relief. This was an interesting one. So there was a big uh, um, earthquake in Turkey uh, a couple of years back, and it's the most one of the most densely populated areas of Turkey. And essentially, what they did was they used AI to look at this entire landscape, this entire geography, to be able to plot out what the uh, shortest route was that was open to go from point A to point B. So they basically took two plots on the map to figure out how they could get people out of there as safely as possible. And they were able to, um, you know, basically analyze these images to see where the damage was, to be able to see where um, there, there could be challenges, where buildings might have fallen, blocked roads, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is happening a lot more um, when the big earthquake in Haiti occurred last year. You guys may have heard about it. I think it was a 7.1 earthquake or something like that. They used a similar method to be able to get from one side of Haiti to the other. So this is becoming more and more predominant capturing images with satellite, capturing images with, with uh, drones, be able to analyze that back and then uh, get people safe as soon as they can, get them uh, any kind of medical supplies that they need. Medical, um, really big, right? There's uh, more and more examples of how, um, you know, we're, we're catching um, cancer and tumors and, and other um, challenges, anomalies in our bodies by using AI um, and, and seemingly at a, at a much more uh, uh, accurate rate than even, you know, years and years of training MDs, right? Now, there's, it's going to be interesting to see where this kind of starts to um, uh, fall into place in everyday life. I think there's a lot of examples where um, this medicine is still very expensive for, uh, for um, practical applications. And so, uh, you know, it, when my wife goes for her next mammogram, you know, I'm guessing that it's going to be a doctor looking at that and they're not going to put the image through an AI model to be able to detect if there's something that they're not <laughs> seeing, right? So I know they're doing it for experimental reasons, um, but I'm curious to see how this comes up. But we're hearing some amazing things and, um, you know, basically being detected at a lot better pace than uh, MDs can. Agriculture. This one I thought was pretty cool as well. So they're taking a ton of factors to determine what the crop yield will be. So on a given year, you have no idea what the weather is going to be. You've got an idea, but you don't have a strong idea of what the weather is going to be, right? Um, you don't know what other kind of issues could happen. And so they're taking a bunch of parameters to feed into these models, things like, um, you know, the weather, obviously. Uh, so a little more depth it was. Nope. I didn't I didn't <laughs> um, so we've got the weather, right? We've got soil quality. Um, you know, we've got the type of crop. We've got um, years worth of yield to understand what we can get from it. And this helps the farmers to be able to um, not only understand what the prices will be that they can sell at based on what they're going to sell, right? It's all based on uh, supply and demand. Um, you, you're going to have to. Um, it, it helps them to know what their um, um, their income levels will be. It helps them to um, you know set up any kind of future deals and things like that that they're going to use. Um, the one on the right here is uh, an example of using I think it's called the wheat bot. I believe is the name for it, right? So it's an AI driven Roomba for. <laughs> for lack of a better uh, example, where it goes and it weeds your garden for you, right? So it's plucking the weeds out as it goes along. So this is just an example of how it's detecting the different types of plants based on what's in your garden and can then, you know, plus the correct um, uh, weeds out. And then finally, insurance. This is becoming more, more and more predominant. Um, you're seeing it with like the more 
advance insurance companies. I've got a particular bias against insurance companies because I think that they just take all our money and run away, right? But uh, but there are some that are sort of forward looking and using technologies like this um, to be able to you know assess the damage on a vehicle um, you know more quickly. Uh, you know the traditional process was send an agent out to the field, look at the damage, send that information to a body shop after he writes it up. Then they come back with an uh, assessment of what it's going to cost. Then they uh, you, you schedule with the garage. The garage goes and looks at it, and they say, "Oh well, no, that's not right. You know, we got we got to spend another five thousand to fix your car, or no, it's total to whatever it happens to be." So you know, we got to start this process all over again. Well, ideally, they are now um, giving us a um, a platform to be able to upload our picture immediately. Um, based on the, the gear make and model of the vehicle, um, looking at the, the damage compared to what the original car looked like, right? They've trained it with the image of a good vehicle versus, you know, an example here. Um, what's the car's value? And they can much more quickly on the spot tell you, here's what we've uh, assessed the damage at, you know, is it worth fixing? You know, those kinds of things can be answered very quickly. So we've got a perfect world. AI is just perfect, right? Well, not so much. Right. So we talk about breaking CNNs. Um, the the most predominant example is the adversarial example. So now, whether this is an example of um, an obscure image, right? So you know, we we talk about the cats being upside down and all that kind of stuff. But what if a cat's hiding under a blanket? All you can see is their tail, right? Or you can see half their face. How do you know it's a cat? Um, you know, so it could be something as innocent as that. It could also be something that somebody threw into an image and intentionally trained it the wrong way, right? To break that CNN, right? Um, and basically, every time that you feed that in, it downgrades your model and makes it less accurate for what it needs to identify. So really, basically. Um, these are misclassified examples that are only slightly different, right? And they basically can cause major data issues as a result. Now, how do we fight against them? So there's a lot of a lot of different ways, a lot of different approaches that people are taking, right? Um, they're actually building CNNs to detect images within the CNN that are adversarial. They call that adversarial training as an example, right? Um, there are uh, examples of, you know, people going out and um, retraining again, you know, based on their base image to then build up that, um, that uh, model itself, right? But all this stuff is very costly and very expensive because of the fact that you have to use all that processing power to then retrain your model. So, um, there, there are definitely some challenges out there. Another one is, is um, using the maximum gradients, right? So you can see the top positives or the top negatives. This picture looks like a panda. In those pictures, it looked like a panda too, but it's been misclassified because you, you're using the top gradients the way that uh, the, the image is being detected using the CNN. And so now it thinks it's a llama. Right, and that was the strongest return. Yes, sir. Wait, how does that work? Like, what's happening? Uh, so, truthfully, it's it's a distortion on the image, right? So you think about the gradient. Um, I don't know beyond that, like what level that is. Do you have any idea on the gradient portion? Sorry, I missed the. So, why is this detected as a panda here at ninety nine point nine five percent? But what happens when it comes up back as a llama? And it's because of the gradient sample. Um, but I don't know what the actual gradient distortion oh, is. Yeah, no, I don't. Okay. Uh, I've got the article, right? It's right there. So when you look at slides, it, honestly, it's a lot of uh, really, really deep CS jargon that kind of hard to really understand the air bullet because um, I'm just not an expert in the space. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, it's, uh, but basically it's it's a filter they put on that, that kind of screwed up the image. Actually. We're gonna we're gonna see the slides. Yeah, I usually post them. I sometimes forget, but eventually I'll post them. Or if you have some data, I'll post it faster. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, it's basically that 
that filter that they put on, um, and and that's what distorted the image. Then we have the problem of overfit. We talked about this some the other day, but you know, essentially, it's too complex for the problem that it's solving. It's sort of this high level um, definition of overfit, right? And so, um, you know, you've got either too many filters in your and then um, the layer uh, um, and, and too many layers in your deep learning models. And this is generally identified um, when your, your model has a low error in the training set, but a higher error in the testing set. Okay. And so, I mean, that's like a quick check to see if you have overfitting as a problem. Um, and, you know, essentially the, the best way, again, is to um, rebalance what your um, your data set looks like in order to fix it. And then the next one is uh, a class imbalance, okay, where some classes have a significantly higher number of examples in the training set, right, and then other classes in the deep learning models. And so, you know, if you've got uh, a thousand pictures of cats in your model and only 10 pictures of dogs in your model, it's going to do a lot better job of detecting those cats as opposed to the dogs. And so, you know, um, the recommendations here are, are basically um, balance out using oversampling or undersampling, right? And, and that way you can um, go back in and um, reassess and rebuild that model. Um, okay. So, there's a whole bunch of tools you can use <laughs> at the end of the day, right? Um, so when we talk about, um, you know, some of the open source capabilities, you know, things like TensorFlow, Keras, um, you know, from a framework, um, you know, they've got the libraries built in. Uh, you know, I thought this slide was good because it, it really captured all of the elements that come into play as you are um, building your models, training your models, uh, testing your models, and then, you know, putting them into production, if you will. Um, of course, these are the common open source tools. And then, you know, your, your major cloud vendors, um, uh, public cloud vendors, your, your major vendors of, um, uh, uh, I guess, real world examples where they have a um, uh, computer vision service involved. Right, they're going to have a lot of services on their own. So whether they're, um, you know, branching uh, an open source source option and building more features into it, whether they are using some of these tools uh, behind the scenes. Uh, in our example, we're going to look at Microsoft's um, Seeing AI tool, which is um, a, a tool you can have on your phone. And essentially, what it allows you to do is you know just use a, a real simple interface um you know but most likely you're seeing it do some of these tools in the background um as they've you know built up their models and stuff like that as well so i just thought this was a good grab here just to kind of look at what all the tools are right so then using seeing ai um we've got the ability to more um, more quickly, I guess, automate the process. So um, just as a, an example here, right? So you can see just a pretty simple interface, right? And you got the things down the bottom, those are your options, okay? Right, I don't know if you guys have seen this tool. It's a free open source tool designed for using um, you, you can grab it. Um, it's designed to help with accessibility and things like that. But so now it's got a few different modes. It's got a, a text mode. So if we look at the screen here and we go. You guys hear that? All right. So, what are the big use cases for this? All right, so, thank you. <laughs> She's just going to keep going. Um, 
but when we so when we look at um, you know we've got some great examples out there where um, you know uh, a blind person is sitting in a restaurant and they want to be able to read the menu if they don't have a braille menu available for them they can use this tool to read the menu to them right um, we've got the ability to scan a document so it's, you can so it wants me So now you can see that it scanned the document. So it's kind of, I mean, we're seeing a lot more of this, right? Dropbox can do this. Your notes application on your, your iPhone can do this, right? So it scans all that. Um, in the in the other practicum class, the SE one, we're actually building one of these uh, for court documents. Okay, perfect, yeah. Um, you've got a barcode reader for looking up products, right? Um, the person example, can I take my mask off briefly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're actually, uh, they released official guidance that we don't actually have to, instructors can not wear a mask when teaching, no. Okay, great. Um, so, <laughs> 51 year old man, brown hair. Wearing glasses, looking neutral. I'm not 51. <laughs> Damn you. Um, <laughs> it's not very kind. And I got 27 the other day. So really I was good? like, I'm good. <laughs> looking happy, right? I still think I'm 51. Though. Damn you. That's painful. All right. Um, then there's a, a currency. Currency predictor, so you can scan your currency, and then this one's in pretty new. Okay. People sitting in a room with laptops, right? So this is a free app, right? So just imagine what the paid ones can do, right? It's, it's got some pretty cool stuff. Um, <laughs> I still haven't figured out how to use it, um, but like there are supposed to be applications for this where. You're in the woods hiking, and assuming you have signal, you can scan a plant. What is this plant? Or you can scan an image of a plant. I kid you not, there must be 16 plants that look like poison ivy, right? I don't know which one it is, but they all look very similar. I leaves a three, let it be. Anybody ever heard that expression, right? So um, for things like that, you know, when when you just don't know, you know, oh, I've got this reaction, what did I touch? Things like that. Um, there are some really, really cool real world applications for stuff like that. So, um, you know, what I thought was interesting, Lincoln and I were talking about, is to get your take on how do they apply that? How do they build that? Right. So, I mean, you heard it was reading instantaneously, right? Now, I mean, these are pretty powerful. So, 12 Pro, you know, pretty powerful, but it doesn't have a ball sitting in it, right? So any thoughts on how this is working so quickly? It's like the network or the model of the cloud or something. It's like computing power provided that way. So yeah, so I mean that 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 it seems plausible, right? That it's it's working that quickly. I still don't know why it says it's like 51. That's terrible. But uh, <laughs> but you know it's um can it work that quickly is is my question, right? Can it, can it get up to Microsoft server, wherever it is, you know, be sure we have content delivery networks, you know? Yeah. Is there any other system client model that optimize for edge development? That's what I'm thinking more about, right? Is that they probably have something very, very close to here, you know, where they're using their content delivery network, to your point, and they've got an edge model, right? Because we've got technology where you've got a manufacturing floor, for instance, and you're looking for anomalous behavior inside that manufacturing floor that could be anywhere, right? So you use a Raspberry Pi device, you use all of the, um, the uh, AI uh, machine learning models that can help you detect that anomalous activity, um, you know, quality sample, whatever it happens to be, sitting on the floor in that manufacturing building that can very, very quickly tell you that there's a problem, 
So my guess, without knowing, is that they are probably, they probably have an edge device that's close by the content delivery network that constantly updates that model so it can very, very quickly respond back to your phone. Because what's the point of having to send it up and wait a minute for you know something to come back, right? So we've got a decent signal here, so it's very, very quick to respond. So computer vision, right? Started at 59 by sticking a probe in the back of a cat's head. <laughs> here we are 60 years later, right? And we can detect almost a 43-year-old man as a 51-year-old, right? We've got massive growth in the last 20 years in this capability. We, we, we've seen, you know, GPUs, CPUs, FPGAs explode. Anybody see what happened with NVIDIA's earnings yesterday? Anyone? Um, like 10, 20%, something like that? So they beat the market. They crushed the market. Um, oh, their earnings. Sorry. Yeah, their earnings. Their yeah. stock price. I know was, uh, there was a joke on Wall Street bets about, like, uh, if uh, if you just invested in NVIDIA yesterday, you would have actually beaten the inflation they're predicting. So it was like they were up 7 or 8% inflation predicting 6 or 7%. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, so um, I bought it on Monday because there was a huge dip last week. I bought it on Monday, and I saw a 15% gain as of yesterday. As of yesterday. Today, I've lost almost all of it. <laughs> because the market, we know, responds to not just those earnings calls, right? The market responds to what else is happening in the world. There's a lot of discussion about what's happening in Ukraine uh, and, and things like that, so there's concerns about that. Even though they absolutely crush projection. What does NVIDIA make? GPUs, right? Where are those GPUs going? Um, Bitcoin mining. They're going to Microsoft. <laughs> they're going to Amazon. They're going to IBM. They're going to Google, right? And then maybe you can get a, uh, an NVIDIA chipset on your computer once in a while. But they're, they're being sucked up by the big cloud vendors because, as, as we were discussing the other day, they can process these machine learning models that much faster than CPU. We're, we're using CNNs everywhere, um, whether we know it or not, right? Um, and, you know, um, we, they do require that constant retraining, and there are a lot of people trying to figure out how do we, how do we avoid from making mistakes so that our cars do respond when the tractor trailer stopped in front of us. Or, more importantly, when there's a cat under a blanket on the seat of this cat. So, any questions? Any thoughts? Anything we didn't cover that, that sort of burning desire? Um, like I said, in the slides, there are a ton of links. Um, none of this material is mine, of course. So, <laughs> um, you know, and feel free to reach out if, if there are any additional questions about any of the resources or if we're missing anything. Um, I also wanted to add one thing that uh, I don't have a lot of uh, backing for, um, but I've been seeing, I was, I was just, my Google foo was like totally off last night. But they're starting. You're starting to see CNNs getting applied to not computer vision um, more aggressively. So, like traditional neural networks are used in AI like all the time, but convolutional neural networks are generally used almost exclusively with image processing of various sorts. But they're starting to be used in other stuff. And the one I remember seeing was basically, um, basically, it was like like some kind of population detection so basically um looking at uh popular like how like covid for example might be spreading in a population using a convolutional neural net um but I, like i said by by google foo or whatever for the research that actually finds some articles or like other examples uh was failing me last night so i will i will try to keep looking um but i know i've been reading some stuff i just can't find any to put up on the slides. So I thought that was really interesting. I've been a long fan of neural nets um, and they're, I think they're a really interesting part of the AI space. So yeah, I think um, you, you're seeing a lot in, in natural language processing too. Oh, maybe it was, yeah, maybe I saw an NLP one too. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I definitely, I came across some stuff on that, right? Um, you know, so, and, and we've come a long way with the NLP stuff as well. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, like Microsoft can can translate over 110 different languages, um, you know, just on the fly, um, and that's you know through either um, speech to text, 
for text to text translation and things like that, right? So, um, you guys may, may or may not know we've got New England Research and Development Center right over in Cambridge, um, right by uh, uh, the square is that? Uh, thank you. Um, we call it there, it's a Microsoft New England Research and Development Center. Um, so, Microsoft, I believe, has seven RD offices around the world, and that is the most predominant. So, uh, yeah, cool stuff. Another funny related story is that the guy who started that campus uh, was my boss at Red Hat for a while, which I think is kind of funny that he left Microsoft and went to Red Hat, yeah. but he actually started the Nerd Center. Uh, if you're ever holding an event, if you're interested in that sort of thing, they also have uh, free event space if you're doing like some sort of tech meetup or something. Um, it's, it's a really good space. I've used it for, I started the DevOps days here uh, in Boston uh, years and years ago, and we started there. I don't know if they're still running it there or not. Yeah, they moved around a little bit too. Microsoft had COVID, another office. COVID messed everything up. Yeah, yeah. We had another office there too. Um, and that got moved up to uh, Burn. So. All right. So, no more questions. All right. You're up. How do you want to do this unplugging? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me jump into this one first, though, actually. Yep. So it doesn't stop. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm still on the so. Oh, you know what? That microphone was working, by the way. It just oh, it just cool. told me. So All right, so hopefully it sounds not too terrible uh, in the recording. Um, I think we're ready to go. All right, so I literally finished it while we were sitting here. So uh, those are graded, post the grades go, post to the Blackboard uh, for the EDA template. Uh, so feel free to look at that when you get a chance. Um, we're going to start on midterm presentations next week uh, on Thursday. Basically, I'll tell you what you kind of need to do, and then we'll um, have kind of a lab session. You can start working on it, so you can ask uh, you know a bunch of questions when you first start working on it. Um, we do not have class on Tuesday. Uh, remember, Tuesday is a Monday schedule, so if you have a Monday class, make sure you go to that. Related. Shoes office hours, which would normally be on Monday, will be on Tuesday at the same time as they are on Monday. That makes sense. Okay. All right. Last thing. Um, we are, uh, you know, a little bit. I, I'm not sure how like public this sort of thing is, so you know, keep it to yourself. But so we're looking for more faculty to join uh, the faculty I'm a part of, so it's CDS. Um, and as part of that, each of the uh, candidates comes in and gives a talk on basically what their subject area of interest is. Uh, they are 99% data science and machine learning. Um, and so there's a whole mess of them. 
the mess of their talks, right? People are coming in to talk, may present their research or whatever, uh, and that's the, the schedule of events. If you go to one of them and then just give me like a couple of paragraphs of what it was about, um, I'll give you two extra credit points on the final project. And that won't be uh, team credit points, right? It'll be on your grade. That makes sense. Um, so, yeah, so that way, hopefully, you might find something interesting. I saw there was one this past uh, Tuesday that was really, really good. If I thought of this beforehand, I would have told you about it. Uh, so I apologize, but it was it was really interesting. Um, so, questions? All right, cool. All right, so pipeline versus deployment. Uh, any ideas what these terms mean? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Pipeline is the process of building the application or whatever is building the deployment that taking the artifact of the pipeline and then using it as a Yeah, that's that's basically right, I would say. Um normally a pipeline is repeatable versus a deployment is typically a one-off. Okay. Um however, the reason I asked the question is because the terms are often used interchangeably. Okay. Because, uh, like, a deployment kind of implies you produce something to deploy, right? Which is really a pipeline. So I would say in the, in the machine learning world, um, the, the cycle of cleaning up data, you know, uh, generating a model, training, deploying that into some sort of production environment and then being able to consume the results is usually referred to as a pipeline. Um, you see sometimes that same term in software engineering. But not always. So that's why I kind of bring up both because they kind of, like I said, they're sometimes, they're a lot of the times used interchangeably. We are going to usually use the term pipeline because it's ML, um, and that's what really we are talking about. Um, I think it's related to in a software engineering product, there's less like work before deployment in the sense that, um, you know, in order to deploy a, a machine learning model, you have to have like do you know data cleaning and then training and you have to do those over and over again. Whereas with uh, you know software engineering deployment, it's basically just you know in the like compile step. It's it's often you know like it's Python, right? It's just copying files over. So I think that's why there's some confusion there. But that's why I like to bring it up because uh, I like to try to make sure you know what industry terms are going to get thrown around um, as much as I can. All right. Um, and so why do we want to use a pipeline? Uh, why, why is this important? Any ideas? Any other ideas? All right, go ahead. The thing in the bottom, you know, like, you don't have to develop a new system every time you use the version there. Uh, and you use it every time you want to change it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a pretty good answer. Um, I think, let me see if I can. Look at my cheat sheet and see what other answers I had here too. Um, yeah, so basically that. Um, so automate the workflow, automate the updating. Often you can get parallelism depending on what you're doing. Like if it's sophisticated, um, you know, maybe you'll have like multiple data sets, for example, that need to come together to train your model or whatever. You can do the cleaning, for example, maybe in parallel, right? Uh, that's a lot easier if you have some sort of like pipeline. It does that rather than trying to like piecemeal that all together with like a big nasty shell script. Um, so the other thing that you know I don't really have here, but I think it's important to mention is that this is the part of your your work that you do rarely. Okay, the creation of one of these. So as a result, you usually do it, and then you promptly forget how to do it, and then three months later you have to do it again for a different project. And you have to like relearn it all or whatever, um, which is fine. The thing is, is that if you build it at the outset and then you're deploying, uh, you know, my example actually wasn't great. So like, like you you deploy, they make a bunch of changes, then you have to go deploy it again a few weeks later or whatever, and you've forgotten how to do it, and then you do it again, you've forgotten how to do it. So you have to relearn it every time. If instead you set it up in some sort of automated fashion at the get-go, then you kind of can work out the whole problem all at once. And then set it up to just run. And then obviously you'll have to go back and tweak it here and there, but the bulk of it is already done. So you don't have to remember relearn it 
every time you have to go touch it, like every sprint, for example. Um, so that's the big reason I also like setting up these kinds of models because then I don't get bogged down with essentially having to relearn something that you don't use every day. Does that make sense? Like the reason I know Git is because I use it every day. You know, as soon as I stop using Git for a couple of weeks, I gotta go relearn it again. Okay, so um, there's a, uh, it's funny that uh, there's so much overlap with the Microsoft stuff. Microsoft has a really well-documented uh, set of content around this problem. Um, and so I was like, this is a great picture. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use their picture. Uh, so what I wanna point out here is, you know, a couple of things we've talked about that may not be as obvious, right? For if you've mostly done kind of machine learning in, in like classwork. But so, you know, there's kind of like this pipeline that you're building here, but if you notice, there's this create image, right? Um, and then they're gonna, you have the image and then you can feed the image content and then you launch the script, et cetera. But if you notice, this is all, uh, you know, this pipeline, but it's all container based, okay? You know, you have your data stored somehow, uh, which is kind of like, you know, big flat file, like CSVs or something somewhere usually. But um, <clears throat> this is where you're overlapping into this kind of containerization space that we talked about some lecture before now. Um, and so I kind of want to point out that, you know, they even have it in their, their like drawings, right? That it's important to do it this way. Why do you think this, these Docker images or whatever, or these container images are a good way to solve this problem? Any ideas? Like this part of the problem. Yeah. Since it's like what we talked about before and how like, can have a standardized like version dependencies, uh, like you know the environment that it's running in, and, like other things. Exactly, exactly. So, sort of applicable um, uh, technical terminology that you hear a lot is that a Docker image is item potent. Okay, and what that means is, no matter what, how many times you throw it, you know, at a wall or whatever, it's going to do the same thing. Okay, and it won't have any cascading effect on anything else. So if you can containerize uh, basically your work, the, the work activity, then you know that it's a known quantity and if you do it again, you'll get the same result, right? Obviously you won't get the same result because you have different training sets, but you know, and maybe not even with some of the neural network stuff, but the idea is like the inputs, you know, if the inputs are the same and you know, it all works out or whatever, you don't have to mess with what you're building it with, um, and it does two things. One, you know, it, you know what it is, and you can ship it to somebody else who can then also know what it is. Um, but then also, you don't have to remember what you did because you have now a thing that you can just reuse over and over. Again. Does that make sense? All right. So another Microsoft image, which I thought was good. Let me run this table. Um, but what I mostly wanted to point out here, like the scenarios here, I was kind of a little like, Meh. but um, down here, this code in app orchestration. So this is what in software engineering is the closest thing to this ML pipeline idea, which is this concept of CI and CD. Does anybody know what that is? All right, this is continuous integration and continuous deployment. Okay. And this idea in software world is like, um, basically, what you want to do is every time you write a piece of code and commit push it, it just shows up at the other end of the pipeline and shows up in production. Okay. And the reason it can do that is because you have built enough tests and you've built a deployment model and all this other stuff that makes it so that even though you're pushing that code, it's got a whole bunch of like gates it has to make it through, but then it just shows up in production when it's ready rather than any humans being involved. So the most traditional version of that that everyone knows is called Jenkins, which um, have you ever used Bugzilla or Jenkins? Right. Uh, my running joke is that the UI was designed by the same people, they're both awful, like just incredibly difficult to use. Um, but so you'll you'll commonly see Jenkins as the uh, almost almost as like euphemistic for kind of pipelining things or deployment models or any of that stuff. Um, so if you see that, this is actually an open source piece of software, 
but it's it's so ubiquitous that it's almost it's kind of like when you Google somebody, right? Um, in that way. So so Lightsound makes this distinction of this kind of Apache Airflow model, uh, which is that data prep activity, right? And then the actual creating the model itself um, as these two different, and I'm putting out the open source tools just because this one, this cube flow pipelines, is based on Kubernetes, which I don't know if I mentioned in this class or not. Have you ever heard of Kubernetes? Did I talk about that? We talked about two now. But. Okay, so orchestration for containers, but this is growing in popularity and basically. It's got a nice GUI and uh, kind of lets you build a machine learning pipeline. And what's cool about it, this one, is that there's a bunch of companies that will consume them and deploy your model for you. So Azure's version of that is this Azure machine learning pipelines, but you can take the same Kubeflow, theoretically, it may not be perfect, but at least close, and run the same thing at Amazon, you can run the same thing at Google, uh, so you are not vendor locked, which is really nice. Yeah. One thing to add too is um, uh, GitHub has just building in a lot more automation features. Yeah. So you've got Azure DevOps, which would be like the traditional on-prem version, right? Yeah. And then you've got you know GitHub, which is starting to take on a lot more of that capability. Right. It's also right. Microsoft owned. However, uh, they are highly segmented. Like we don't have access to any of their information. They have totally separate networks and everything else. Oh, really? Even though it's owned by Microsoft, they left them independent. The only two Microsoft acquisitions that, that, that that's true of is GitHub and LinkedIn. Yeah, but still totally separate operating companies. So just some, um, you know, GitHub's come a long way in that yeah. regard. Yeah. So I was thinking, I, I've been kind of going back and forth on this a little bit, but basically what I was, planning to recommend to you as, as teams is to look at GitHub Actions for doing these deployment models. If you wanted to take a more sophisticated route, these Kubeflow pipelines or you know, Azure Machine Learning pipelines um, might be a more sophisticated way that's a little bit more tailored to machine learning, whereas the GitHub Actions is kind of, it's a little bit more like, you can do whatever you want, you know, and it'll trigger on demand. Um, so, but it, it was the only answer for, for the most part. Uh, you know, if you want to kind of something with a low barrier to entry and relatively inexpensive. Um, but this is getting pretty slick. Um, so right now I actually reached out to some friends of mine to find out if uh, we have any expertise, um, like in, in my friend network kind of, that could provide some mentorship who wanted to look at Kubeflow, um, you know, more detail, maybe, you know, uh, have somebody we could call with questions. Right now. Um, and Chris was going to ask around with his people, find out the same kind of answer. Uh, so we might have some help there if we wanted to do that. Um, does this make sense? Like I just, I thought the grid was pretty good, um, and especially the open source kind of version. Um, that's sorry, in case it wasn't obvious. OSS is open source software, um, and I don't, know, I thought it was useful. All right, so. <clears throat> is problematic when you start doing automation is uh, what's referred to as separation of concerns normally. Uh, and the other thing is I was going to point out because this comes from my especially consulting background but or corporate background is that you're not allowed to say best practices anymore for the lawyers. Okay. And the reason is is because you can get sued over whether or not it actually is the best. Okay. So you try hard not to say the best practice anymore. Uh, and instead you say like good ideas or things to consider or stuff like that. Red Hat actually had like a replacement phrase that I can't remember uh, that, that was quite good, but I, I can't remember what it was, that actually came from like the lawyers. Um, but so a couple of things I want to point out here, right? So when you are doing these kinds of automation activities, Try very hard to disconnect your environment creation from your configuration. Okay, does anybody know what that means? Any guesses? All right, so environment creation is like, uh, you know, setting up those containers, right? Or setting up some virtual machines or making sure the data is in the right place or 
that kind of thing. So that's like environment creation. So like, where is all this stuff going to run? Okay. And all the parts that you need to get it to run versus configuration, which is where this is where like your model parameters go. Okay. Or um, the example I was looking at was like talking about whether or not you're using like a CNN or linear regression or something like that. That would be like configuration. Okay. So try to keep that those two types of content separate and you'll usually have a better time primarily because of this this bullet here which maybe should have been the second bullet but if you can test that the environment is set up correctly but you're failing stuff you basically you know where the problem is right it's either failing in creation of the environment or that environment setup stuff or it's failing in kind of trying to build models or trying to execute those models. So that gives you a big hint as to where in the code base the problem is. Uh, so that's a big reason to do it. Um, another big reason is this second bullet, which is you are likely to have kind of a development environment where you're just messing with stuff and you want to make sure things that in the, make sure things are kind of like, you know, are the models doing what you expect them to do, right? Um, you know, sometimes we call this exploratory, if you want to put a nice name on it. I call it messing with stuff. Um, but so if you have that separation of the configuration from your environment, then you can have multiple configurations that are all like, you know, stored in your source control system separately. And then, does anybody here know, I don't, I don't know how prevalent this term is outside of Linux. Does anybody know what a symlink is? It's, uh, it's exactly what it sounds like if you think about it. It's actually short for symbolic link. Uh, so if you use Windows, it's the same, well, from a user experience perspective, it's the same as a shortcut. Uh, it's actually implemented completely differently underneath, which is always a pain in the butt in Windows. Um, if you have a Mac, you actually, if you ever do a pointer to some other file, like the same, you know, it's like the same name, but somewhere else on your file system, uh, that usually is a symlink. It'll just do it, but it doesn't like doing. So basically, the idea is that if you have your configuration is a symlink called configuration, right? And then it symlinks to prod or symlinks to test or symlinks to dev. It makes it a lot easier to kind of switch between them, and it kind of is a little bit self-documenting, so that the next person who comes along and looks at it, then they know that you know which bit is which, and that if they change that symlink around, it'll point to the different ones. Um, and then lastly, automate your testing. Uh, as part of one of these pipelines, don't forget to test, right? So part of the actions that you're building into your environment is that, you know, are things working correctly, right? Did the environment get created? Is the data in the right place? Did the data get cleaned correctly? So kind of going back a little bit to that EDA template thing, it can be useful to have some scripts that just, you know, do things like check for a goal after data cleaning. You know, did it, you know, did you get the data back that you expected? Um, and so, but if you can kind of build that directly into your pipeline, then nobody has to remember to do it. Um, and it's, it kind of continuously is there. The trap here is when you're in a hurry and there's a deadline and you have automated testing in there and the testing fails. And so you just fix it rather than fix the test and ignore the test because you have to get the deadline out. Very, very bad. That will that will pile up and be painful later. So try to fix those tests. You know, if you can't do it immediately to the deadline, you know, deadline's on a Tuesday, that means you know what you're doing on Wednesday, you're fixing all those tests. All right. All right. So um, because I thought it'd be fun, um, I kind of basically followed along with Microsoft's tutorial. Um, and I thought I'd show it to you uh, because I thought it was a good example of a pipeline as well as something to consider. Um, but I'm not married to it. You know, AWS SageMaker is also pretty good. Um, I just I tend to shy away from Amazon implementations of these kinds of things because they often do not use like the open source whatever underneath. It's often something custom. It often means they're first to market. 
but it also means that they don't follow whatever the open source is, and so you get vendor locked to Amazon pretty hard. Um, but oh, and of course, timed out or something. All right, so yeah, so I thought this was pretty fun. Uh, but yeah, so I just tried to drop this whole like data model, like just this machine, you know, it does linear regression, it just does the thing. But so they have a bunch of sample data sets, um, you know, so the automated field price data is a sample. Then you can do some clean data cleaning in here, right? And you can kind of connect the dots together. But then you kind of say in here, right? You can say, uh, like you can actually say get rid of that column which is bad data um, and then later on there's one that's um, this one which is uh, dump uh, no I'm setting it in the wrong place there's something like oh yeah here um, so it's like uh, if it finds a you know a null just dump the whole row um, you know, and then you split the data into uh, clean and dirty, and then you put it into a model trainer. You tell it what kind of model you want to use, and then you can score the model, and then you can evaluate the model. Um, so I haven't actually seen the results for this. I did submit it, but I don't know how to find out what my results were. But it's kind of neat. But you know, I thought it was a, a kind of an interesting toy. But most importantly, what I wanted to show is that you know I have a pipeline now, right? And so I can insert my real data here, you know, if I wanted to write a custom model here, I want to change the configuration around, like I didn't do all of that, you know, I didn't for my stupid little demo, but the uh, the idea is that now I have this pipeline and now I, I don't know, like I don't have to care how it works anymore, right? I can solve that problem once, it might take me a couple of days to figure it all out, but then I can just say, save, run, you know, like I don't have to think about it anymore. And then this, I didn't actually investigate for this particular tool, but it can be, it's nice when it gets sophisticated enough that it can actually monitor where the data was. And so if the data gets updated, it reruns it, or same with like source code. So like, you know, your Python code or whatever that's actually building your model. Um, most of these things can be triggered normally. So it wouldn't surprise me if you can do this, but normally it can be triggered by those changes. Do you have a question? I was going to say, uh, are you writing the code for it, or is it just like you just so write I it? did not. You can. You can write your own custom code. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sort of. I mean, like you can kind of insert it into various places. And you can write like Python. Yeah. 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 Or at least as far as I can tell. Yeah. Also, what's under machine learning algorithm? Can you design yeah. all that work? Yeah. It was crazy. I was like, oh, this is cool. Um, yeah, but like I totally just screwed around with a neural network with regression. Uh, multi-class decision, oh, multi-class neural nets, you know, so like, there's all this stuff just kind of built in. Um, so I thought it was neat, but most importantly, whether you use this tool or use any of the little things in the bucket, this part is really important. And, and underneath, at the end of the day, this is the thing that's cute flow. So I, don't, I didn't find the export button, but I believe you can kind of export this into a file and then go run it on Google. That's so cool. Yeah, you can you can look at the code. You can actually look at the notebook that's running underneath it. Um, so this is the studio where you can do a, a, sort of the the whizzy wig. You guys familiar with that term? What you see is what you get, right? It allows you to do the drag and drops and all that kind of stuff right there on the screen. Um, but then machine learning workspaces, which is sort of like a level up from this. Allows you to manage all your notebooks. It allows yeah. you to manage all your data sets. You know any connections that you need, all that kind of stuff. That's sort of the next level up. Right. So. At the end of the day, because because it's Kubeflow, right? It's that if you really want to, you don't have to use this nice pretty designer. You can just open it up in a big huge text file and go. You know, insert the various configuration that you want for your particular thing. Um, Again, like I said, I'm not sure 100% of the import and export with the Microsoft version, but I'll tell you right now, because it's Kubeflow and it works with Kubernetes, which is a massive open source project, and Kubeflow is as well, um, there's got to be a way to just create one of those files manually and then just go deploy it in any Kubernetes, uh, whether that's being hosted by, because Amazon does have a Kubernetes tool, you know, or Google, or, you know, from Red Hat, right, OpenShift is, is their uh, entry in that space. 
or Azure, right? Uh, and, and for me, at least most importantly, I can run that Kubernetes local on my laptop while I'm messing with it, trying to figure out how to make it work correct. So I just thought it was neat. I thought it was a good example of the pipeline uh, and it was a fun little demo. Um, in the slides, if you want to go play with it yourself, uh, here, um, you know, and when I post it, you can grab it, but this is basically the tutorial I call it. Basically, it's like, click here, now click here. Uh, so, you know, play with it as you like. Um, but one of the things that we're going to do, my suspicion is it'll probably land after spring break, um, but we're going to go through as each team and say, are you doing your deployments? Let me see your pipeline. What are we going to do there? How's this going to work? And you're going to say, okay, we're going to use GitHub Actions. We're going to put Python scripts here. And we're going to put data over there and that kind of stuff. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, do that collectively. Like I'm going to try to help you do that, but then we'll have an assignment that is where you fill in all those answers and then actually start that pipeline and have it running in the background while you continue the rest of the semester project work so that every time you do an update, you know, ish, uh, you'll get new models out. Does that make sense? So that's why I wanted to bring it up. Uh, you know, just give you a little bit of an introduction, but I don't expect you to tomorrow go build a pipeline, right? I mean, if you do, that'd be cool, but that's not my expectation. Uh, so questions? All right, just a couple of reminders. Templates are actually graded. <laughs> Mentor stuff starts next week. Um, no class on Tuesday. Shoes to office hours will be on uh, Tuesday on his Monday schedule. Um, and then, you know, if you want to go to some of those talks, I thought the pipeline of talks looked pretty interesting. So, you know, if, find something that looks interesting and, and go. It'd be cool. The thing, if you notice, there's a, yeah, so that date, the March 4th, there are events after that. But the ones I want you to go to, and I think you'll find interesting, are all the ones that are happening before March 4th. However, there's probably another five or so that haven't yet that will probably land after March 4th. So I'll, I'll move that date whenever those get scheduled. Cool. All right. Any questions? Otherwise, I'll wrap it. All right. Thanks, y'all. Oh, yeah. oh, I know I had to put the reply on.